When I first played Anodyne, I didn't realize how incredibly cryptic and symbolic the game was. So I took the time to break apart each individual member of the game to talk about its overall meaning. So without further ado, let's talk about Anodyne's story. Anodyne is far from being completely coherent in its meaning. The main story is simple enough, but it's fairly clear that there is a deeper meaning to the narrative that takes place. So let's talk about that. And heads up guys, this is a spoiler heavy video for Anodyne. If you're looking for a review about it, you can click over here and watch the one I made as an amateur critic. In said review, I mentioned that I believe Anodyne to be a coming of age game. That is to say, a young person growing up and the angst that comes with such changes. So let me elaborate on that further. We know for a fact the main character's name is Yun from the beginning, because that is how early characters refer to him. However, in the later half of the game, you reach the creepy town. If you read the text stone in the very entrance of said town, it reads, Yun Town. Welcome to Yun Town. Please beware of some of the citizens. They don't play well with others. Tread carefully. Now, Yun Town was founded sometime in the 90s by Mayor Ying as a part of a series of ongoing housing projects as a reflection of Ying's denial of possessing the name Ying and an assertion of the name Yun. I think it's safe to say the main character's real name is Ying and not Yun. This is an important revelation in that we now know the world is metaphorical rather than a literal fantasy world so we can safely look for a meaning in the game. So let's begin. We start out in a weird tutorial area, but we are soon put into what seems to be a highway with roadblocks. As we walk through the area, this happens. Take note of the stranger danger, we'll come back to it. We soon meet the sage. He tells us our job is to protect the briar, and in order to do that, we must search out these MacGuffins. So we are put into the overworld where the first three dungeons are located. There is a dungeon in the swamp, the forest, and the mountains. The dungeon we must first go to is the forest area. We start to set off on this journey, but we are immediately stopped by Mitra and her bike she named Wares. What is interesting about Mitra is she seems detached from Yin's fantasy world. This is evidenced by her saying, You want to protect the briar from the evil darkness? Well, I have no clue what you're talking about, but it sounds cool, I guess. She even says that you and her are fellow travelers, implying that Mitra is likely a person in the real world like Yin. Yin parts ways with Mitra and proceeds to go through the forest dungeon all the way to the boss. This is where we fight the Seeing One, who comes out with some curious dialogue. Precious little Yun, playing the hero. I've witnessed every step you've taken in the land, and let me tell you, Yun, not everyone here is as honest as me. Be careful of who you'll trust. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with voices. At any rate, this isn't just foreshadowing the sage's betrayal of you in late game. It could also mean the Guardian is someone close to Yun. In fact, it's odd he calls Yun by his pretend name. There are two likely possibilities, either this is some manifestation of Ying's inner thoughts or the seeing one is a house relative, like a mom or dad. This is punctuated by the statement of, I've witnessed every step you've taken in this land. And his last words, I'll be with you whenever you are alone. This makes me think the seeing one is part of Ying or a close relative offering Ying comfort. We then move on to a large, sprawling open world to look through. Take note that it is all nature-based environments. Ying goes to the beach and sees the shadow that randomly disappears. This happens periodically throughout the game. After you fall into the whirlpool, you will proceed to the next dungeon. Anodyne takes a massive tonal shift as you approach the swamp dungeon. This is the part of the game where you're swimming through apparent pools of blood and fighting bosses who appear to be an abomination who says, each generation is born from pain to die in pain. We will not suffer to reproduce the cycle. We will not go outside. 
I think we can solidly say that this is a manifestation of Yin's angst and reclusiveness is a product of it. Take note of the Swamp's Dungeon Stones, as they tell a story that compound the angstful emotions. They read, We never asked for this. We would have not have brought our lives with her suffering. Other stones read, One day, our mother left her mother to venture into the poisonous fog. This makes it seem as if Yin's mom might have died during childbirth. It would explain the gratuitous amounts of blood-licking liquid and the statement of the abomination saying, Each generation is born from pain to die in pain. That all being said, it is also possible it's just general angst for childbirth, as no statement was ever given to say anybody died during birth. It could just be pointing out that birth is painful and bloody, and it would work just as well to explain away the dungeon's themes. A death of a mother, however, could be the possible identity of the seeing one, if we believe it could be female, though the face of the seen one looks masculine to me. Regardless of all that, I am positive the abomination is a manifestation of Yin's angst and fear of the outside world. This is clear with the line, venture into the poisonous fog, likely referring to the outside, and the abominations, we will not suffer to reproduce the cycle, we will not go outside. The entirety of this section of the game reads as a temper tantrum as well. All the text is capitalized and shaking as if yelling. And the last words of the abomination are that of a simpering child. Is this your punishment for our rebellion? Let's move on to the next dungeon, which is in the mountains. Up to now, enemies have just been animals or nondescript creatures with no symbolic meaning to them. This is no longer true for the mountain dungeon. It is here we meet husk-like creatures. They are non-hostile and they are basically humans that just wander around making weird, sinister laughing noises. I believe this to be a part of Yane's antisocial personality and his fear of strangers, as they are non-violent and don't do anything, yet they are everywhere in the dungeon, and they still seem creepy as if they are just strangers we don't know. This is the beginning of Yin's insecurity, and it will evolve throughout the game. We get to the boss, and continuing the theme, we receive another piece of enlightenment from him. He says, So good to see you, Yane. Been too long. Still playing those Nintendos, I see. We can glean three things from this. One is the fact that it sounds like this is an embodiment of a relative or family friend of Ying, who is much older than him, hence the it's been too long and referring to all video games as Nintendos, a common stereotype for the non-gaming generation who is normally older. The second thing is still playing, which tells us that, in this person's eyes, Yin is too old to be playing games. If I were to hazard a guess, this may be a personal subject to a young developer. What we can say is that Yin is likely older, probably a teen, and he's dealing with the social trope of putting away your toys and growing up. This is something that if you're watching this video, you probably, like me, have an idea of how that makes you feel. The third interesting thing is that he calls this Yin rather than Yin or Young. We now have a second instance that shows Yin wants to be young. However, you may think this causes some contradiction with establishing Yin as Yun's true name, because the boss says Yang. But in the boss's last words, he says, Jesus, Yan, when are you going to grow up? You know, you're going to have to deal with people sooner or later. The boss calls him Yan, which means he doesn't care enough about Yin to get his name right. Also, again, the statement about Yin dealing with people comes up again. This ends the first half of the game. To start the second half, we must turn on this windmill. Take note, because this is the first piece of technology we've seen in-game, and it marks a turning point for the game's mood and story. The later half of Anodyne is a product of Yin moving into a new home, and his imagination running wild. We meet this place first. It is a Nexus-esque place, with these large blocks that have crowns on their heads. They claim to be the rulers here, and these small pyramids here say they visit the cube via hologram because the cube is lonely here. I'll be honest here guys, I have no clue what to make of this section. The best I can come with is it's a representation of Yin isolating himself and only talking to people over the internet. That's a massive stretch and I consider it a major spitball. So comment down below if you think you get it, but I'm just going to ignore it and move on. We reach the next dungeon, the hotel. 
We know it's a hotel because we fight spider eye things, maids, exterminators, and dogs. And to put it all on top, the last boss says things like, We have all the finest amenities here. How do you like the pool? And his last words being, We hope you enjoyed your stay. This again is Ying not dealing well with people, but this time it's in a hotel. The maid, the dogs, the exterminators are all clear, but the eyes are a bit out of place. I think they're either hotel staff or security, who Ying always feels like is looking at him. And the final boss is likely a manager, judging from his dialogue. He also is represented as an eye. So again, Yin doesn't like people very much. To go on to the next dungeon, you must go through the most disturbing part of the game, the creepy town. Next to the weird noise and the TV static, you can immediately tell something sinister is happening here. This is where you'll find Ying's real name. The town is populated with two distinct enemies. The first are these neutral humans who just say things of no real value. And these black human shaped shadows will bring the pain if you aren't careful. There's something all these houses have in common. They all have a TV on with a man shooting. I assume this signifies the fact that the town is just an assertion of what Ying thinks the suburbs are like. And the dark shadows are criminals that harm you. Hence why the family that was murdered had two of them inside their house hiding. I will go even further and say that Yin thinks this is what the suburbs are like because of the violent way it is portrayed on TV. That's why there's a man shooting in every home, along with the sound choice of the area and the almost weird TV snow filter put over it as well. There isn't much to say about the real dungeon. I think it's symbolic of Yin's discomfort of the suburbs still. In short, it's yet another home, likely an apartment that overlooks a city. The boss is a trench coat, hockey mask wearing guy who says he likes fire. So I assume this is yet again what Yin thinks an arsonist is like. It would explain the very cheesy dialogue and get up as well. The final dungeon is the circus. And to be honest, there isn't much to glean from this area either. For all I can tell, the areas are entertainment related. The first segment seems to be an old video game. I presume it's a projection of Yin's inner gamer. And then you have the circus as the main dungeon. The final boss of said dungeon are acrobats, and when you defeat them they say, We have failed to make you pay for your interference, and yet you have given us back our chance to be free. Thank you, Yun. May the scene one look upon you in favor once more. And then they jump into the pit to their death. I think the suicide is just a representation of the fear slash anticipation of a circus acrobat falling? Or at the very least it doesn't represent anything. I'd like to point out the comment, May the scene one look upon you in favor once again. I'm beginning to suspect that, again, the scene one is a relative close to Yin and that he fears said relative disapproves of him. With all the dungeons beaten, we can finally make it to the final boss zone. It is here. Things get even more confusing. So for the sake of clarity, I'm going to present all the content and then theorize about its meaning afterwards. When we get to the boss area, the sage does everything he can to stop us, with his final attempt being him attacking us. Before the attack, he says, Why won't you listen to me? If you rush into this like an idiot, you're going to endanger the briar, the land, and everything I've worked for. I'm sorry, Yun, but if you won't listen to me, then I'll have to convince you another way. After the battle, he says, Yun, this is not how I meant things to be. I meant for you to become a better person. I meant for you to be able to help the briar. But all this is just a game. I can't stop you from reaching the briar. Just remember what I said when it goes to hell. After some puzzles, you meet up with Mitra, Wares, and the Sage. And this dialogue takes place. Done. this is my final warning. Wait, who's that? My name is Mitra. And this is my bike, Wares. I didn't ask the name of your bicycle. What are you doing here? I don't remember you. 
I'm here to help my friend Yun. Yun doesn't have friends. Yun doesn't even have Briar. And if you're egging him on, then I want you out of my world. What do you mean? Where's and I? Shut up about your stupid bicycle. The sage attacks with a fireball. Yin body blocks it, and it leaves the sage speechless. Yun, are you okay? That was a beautiful thing you just did. You go on and finish that final punk ass area. We know you can do it. You think you're Yun's friend because you'll lie to him and tell him deep down he's just perfect and everything will work out? Well, if that's what you want, fine. Get on my face, Yun. We then head to the left area. In this golden brick area, you'll find men and women walking around. I'm not going to read out all their comments, but I'll point out that they are all slightly acidic, say fuck a lot, and they are laughing hysterically. It's hard to tell with the low resolution, but they all seem to be wearing formal wear. The lady in the dress informs us that the streets are made of gold and asks Yun to help take one of the bricks. I think this segment is what Yin thinks adults are like, and the greed and the clothing and how they all act. After running the gauntlet in the area, we trigger the last puzzle piece, see our shadow friend yet again, and unlock the final boss. It is here we find out the shadow man has been the briar all along. And we meet him in color and face to face. He says, Yun, I am tired of all these cycles. I feel like I'm living in the same dream, the same nightmare, over and over again. After you defeat the briar, he says, Goodbye, Yun, and moves into the deep water. You chase after him, but because Ying is unable to swim, he begins to sink. The briar then turns around and says, Dude, Yun! He helps you tread water and says, kick your feet, move your arms. Jeez, you wouldn't last a minute without me. Now able to swim, Yin starts to move around and the briar says, well, come on, let's go get a sandwich or something. Sage then appears to your right and says, you, you did adequately until we meet again. The screen wobbles and saturates until the sage is in a white background. He then walks off shot. Credits roll. Okay, where to start? We need to answer two big questions. Who is the sage and who is the briar? These two questions are subjective and they are clearly meant to be cryptic and odd. But I have two theories about the identities of both. My first theory is that the sage is an old friend of Yin's who doesn't want him to grow up. This explains his attempts to stop you from progressing at the end and why he wants you to explore and play in the wilderness early on. It also shows why he is so hostile towards Mitra, a new friend. As for the briar, he is Yin's more mature self, hence why he is so tired of the same cycle. We are Yin coming to terms with growing up via a boss battle. That is why a briar was hinted throughout the entire game as a shadow. We are progressing and we are growing up and overcoming our personal insecurities. My second theory is the one I think is most likely given the content. Is that briar is Yin's older brother and the sage is Yin's inner self. In the conversation with the sage and Mitra, the sage says Yun doesn't have friends. Yun doesn't even have briar. This makes it seem like the Briar is not only a person Ying can befriend, but one that should be befriended too, like a brother. At the end of the scene, the Briar says, what would you do without me? And let's go get a sandwich or something. These comments seem extremely brotherly to me. And the Sage may be Ying's inner self as almost all of his dialogue, especially at the end, or the voices of dissent, of unsureness. It's Yin second guessing himself and afraid of the world around him. Which brings us to the meaning of the game. All those bosses seem to be manifestations of Yin's inner worries and perspectives. We have the seeing one, who seems like a parent figure, who we find out later Yin thinks disapproves of him. Then there's the abomination, that's Yang's inner angst and discomfort of the outside world. Next is the wall of teeth, who is symbolic of older people who think less of Yin for being introverted and liking video games. Then there's the last three, the arsonists, the eye slash hotel manager, and the acrobats, all seeming to be forms of irrational fear of the real world. Yin 
goes through all of this and defeats them. That is the meaning of anodyne, overcoming irrational things we are afraid of and growing up. Not convinced? I'll even go a step further. In the beginning, the three bosses are typical personal problems. People who don't seem to care about you, your parents, and your own stupid self. These three bosses are in the wooded rural areas, but when you turn on the first piece of technology, you start to encounter the things you're afraid of because Yin doesn't know what it's like in non-rural areas. The reason he's irrationally afraid of these rural areas is because he's moving into a new home. And being an introverted person, he is afraid of new homes in the big city with a lot of people. You know this because in rare cases, when you quit the game, you'll wake up in a half-packed house. After leaving the house, it'll take you back to the title screen. So the theory that Yin is moving is probably canon. Also, the fact that the game world is just a dream is also probably canon. Conclusion time. Abstractly, Anodyne is a coming-of-age game that uses inner struggles of a young boy to show its meaning. Yin fights against what others think, his insecurities, and his fears about the outside world. At the climax of the game, Yin fights his inner self that doesn't want to grow older, and then his brother, who he quarrels with. What it means on a personal level will of course be different for each player. But to put it simply, Sean Hien Tian, one of the game's developers, said this about the game. I made this while still in school. The themes were very much the kind of about things and problems related to friendship and maintaining relationships, and inner struggles we have on the day to day while growing up. Perhaps with this in mind, the sages, or Yin's problematic inner self, last words are far more impactful. You, you did adequately, until we meet again. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this new type of video. Uh, this is a new series I wanted to do. It's called Let's Talk About. And I'm going to be looking at different uh, video game ideas or whatnot and having a more robust opinion about them and starting a conversation, hopefully. Uh, some of them will be theories and explanations to games' narratives like this, while others will be more abstract ideas, and it may not even be... Uh, for a particular game rather than a concept for games in general. We'll see where it goes. However, you shouldn't expect them on the regular. I'm there. This alone took months for me to write and uh, they're, they're really time consuming. So you will, you should expect to see them in the future. Uh, if you're looking for other videos, however, why don't you check out the Anodyne review? If you haven't, it'll be to the bottom right. And if you're looking for other game narratives that are really fucking interesting, you should try Lisa to the left. Alright, you guys take it easy. Later.